Hello and welcome back to the Impact Lounge and this is your weekly Impact Review. I'm your host Adam and as always I'm joined by Ro. How are you today Ro? I'm wonderful Adam. How about yourself? Yeah, really good. It's an early morning over here in the UK. It's uh, just uh, gone 7am and I think for you it's it's close to midnight, is it not? Yes, indeed. So you're getting us both at uh, different ends of the tired spectrum here. But as always, we'll try our best to put out a show. Uh, well, a quality show. We'll put out a show, definitely. The quality of it, you guys can decide who are listening today. Uh, if it's the first time you're stopping by the channel, please do make sure you hit that subscribe button. We're getting ever closer to the 4,000 mark, which is great. Uh, we'd like to get there, certainly by Slammiversary. So uh, if you've already subscribed, uh, create another account, subscribe again, make us feel good. No, I don't really mean that. Uh, just go and tell your friends about us and share it, uh, etc. And always, as always, we ask for your questions as well. We had over 60 comments last week, so that's fantastic to see, uh, especially for uh, an impact review. We always get a lot of questions on some of the other features we do on the channel, so make sure you check out all that stuff, including the interview we did earlier on in the week with Moose. Uh, hopefully, we've got a few more interviews coming up in the coming weeks. But, uh, yeah, as I said, make sure you hit the subscribe. And if you're listening to us on another device, you know, through... Uh, SoundCloud or something like that, make sure you subscribe on there as well and hit that like or dislike button. We really don't mind as long as you've got an opinion. Right. We also usually give a shout out to some people who uh, do some good work out there and are friends of ours in the wrestling podcast community. And today I'm going to give a shout out to some of my fellow UK friends here who I do a show with now and again. They get me on to do their, their pay-per-view reviews for Impact. I'm their, their uh, designated go-to guy for Impact. So make sure you check out the broken but glorious podcast as well right um we usually have a question of the week and uh when we do that we we usually pick one from the comments section which we're going to dive to in the second but we also have a trivia question each week uh what i say each week for the last two weeks and, and there's going to be another one today so so before i go into this week's question what was the answer to last week's i'm sure you're all wondering so over to you ro yes the answer was austin aries so for the three clues I had given out, I said somebody who's been on Impact in more than one occasion with his first time under a different gimmick. For those of you who might not remember, when Austin Aries first appeared in Impact, I want to say in the mid-thousands, he appeared as Austin Starr. Um, he didn't really get too much of a push. I think he was involved with the whole paparazzi series. Then he had came back again in you know the 20 uh 2000 i want to say 12 13 ish and uh where he had gained the most success being uh impact champion as well as tag team champion x division champion and obviously now and also the two things he shares in common with ishimori is both being x division champions and uh, they both use the 450 splash as maneuvers and then the last one he appeared in the uh, music video of the real mccoy yeah, I think the video was uh, Where Cape Will Fly or something along those lines. Uh, not a bad little indie tune there from, uh, I think, uh, about three, four years ago. Right. Well, thank you for that. I don't think anyone got it right. So your questions are way harder than my Apple Teeny based ones. <laughs> uh, so let's go for, for the middle ground today. Let's see if people can get this one. OK, so who am I this week? Uh, I signed to TNA, as it was, in 2012 as an active wrestler. I was on the roster for three years and I never had a match. Um, so, yeah, I was on the roster. I was on the TNA website or Impact website for three years as an active wrestler and I never had a match with them. I did appear as a special guest enforcer and in, in a couple of angles, but never actually had a one on one match in the ring. I left in 2015, but I did return last year. Once again, not as a wrestler, but I was involved in one of the major angles of last year, knocking out a top impact star. So there you go. That's your clue. So that's a clue to who I am this week. I appeared for three years between 2012 and 2015 as an active wrestler, although not having a match. And I reappeared last year in an angle with a top um, impact star who I knocked out. So uh, leave your answers in the comments section below and uh, we can get on with uh, this week's question from the fans. And uh, once again, it's from our good friend Ramon, uh, who asked us if uh, we could have a match or a gimmick match, I should say, by 
uh, for, for the, the knockouts division, what type of match would we like? And he gave us five, uh, well, five options, I should say. So let me just read those out. So it was a first blood match, which I'm guessing the Red Wedding would have been if that ever took place. A casket coffin match, which we might be seeing next week. Uh, I think the last rights match, I think that's quite similar. A five on five lethal doc lock doc down, lockdown match. An ultimate X match and a 30-minute Iron Woman match. So another great question. And if any of you uh, listeners have got a question you want us to ask next week, please leave it in the comments section. But this is uh, Ramon's uh, third time asking a question here. He's obviously putting in the groundwork to come up with some good ones here. So, Ro, what would you like to see? I would say the five-on-five five five lethal lockdown. Yes. That's an option. Yeah, you know, I w I've always thought I said it'd be cool uh, for and this, it was one of the question one question I wanted to ask additionally um, for the most uh, teleconference with the Madison Rain. What's a match that the knockouts could innovate and impact that hasn't really been done before? But when you think about wrestling as a whole, pretty much everything has done been done. So I think something like that, when you're talking about the five on five, it gives an opportunity to get a lot of the women in one match and you know gives everyone an opportunity to shine. So that's something that I'd love to see. Yeah, well, well, before I answered the question as well, just just you put a, a seed in my head there. Um, I, I've always liked silly things in wrestling, you know, and uh, I, whenever I look back at some of my favorite moments in wrestling, uh, they're usually stupid, you know, like the ECW zombie, etc. you know, the, the woo off, all these kind of things, you know, Ric Flair in a wheelchair. But uh, one of my favorite matches from, I'm guessing it would have been the early 90s, I'm not sure, featured Jeff Jarrett versus China in a good housekeeping match. And um, without wanting to come over as very misogynistic mis or sexist, but uh, do you think they could get away with something like that in Impact these days? A good housekeeping match. Do you remember this, Ro? Yes, I want to say it was at <laughs> 99,000. Oh, was it around there? Was it? I, can't, I can't remember. I remember it was for the Intercontinental Champion, and I think the whole anger was Jeff Jarrett saying that uh, women shouldn't be fighting men. So they had a good housekeeping match, which was basically a hardcore match using household items that uh, he claims women would use around the household. So uh, there you go. There's innovation for you. <laughs> anyway, back to, to what I'd like to see. Um, I would actually go for the Ultimate X. You know, I think that obviously it's a signature match for X Division wrestlers, mainly because of, you know, their high flying ability but let's face it you know uh, i think it would it, it would be awesome um for the knockouts i've never seen anything like it i've never seen anything that, that's high flying uh in, in the, the knockouts division you know people said that they shouldn't have ladder matches or they shouldn't have hardcore matches but you know taron and and gail showed that they can put on just as good a match uh with some of these gimmicks so yeah i'd be all for uh an ultimate x match i think it would be really exciting to see because um it's, it's something that's just not been done before so thanks to the question ramon um listeners if you've got a, a different answer even if it's not one of the five that is mentioned then please drop us a, a mention in the, in the comments section there and uh, we'll talk about it next week but um there you go that's uh, that's our question of the week so yeah. i'm guessing Oh, sorry. Go. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Adam. I, there was one more question I wanted to get in just so we can change it up because I know uh, that one was from Ramon and we've answered a lot of his, but I wanted to answer this one from uh, Colby Cooper. And his question was, w would you like to see impact on the USA Network? And I think that's a rumor that had went, or, went around this uh, previous week. I don't know the credence of the rumor. So... Let me get your take. What do you think? Would you like to see impact on the USA network? It's it's really hard to to comment on that. And the reason being is that obviously I'm based in the UK, so that the channel doesn't have an impact on me, you know, over here in the UK. But anything that gets more eyes on the product is would be an amazing thing. And I'm guessing if they were on USA, you know, in a slot similar to the raw one, um, then yeah, it's gonna put more eyes on the product, more eyes on the product, more people come along, more people come along, the crowds look better, the bigger the crowds, the company starts making money. They start making money, they can tie down some of these uh, impact stars like Eli Drake to long-term contracts. So for me, I can't see any downside at all. I really can't see any downside. The only thing that maybe that it could have an impact on is if then USA start you know, saying to them the same way that they say to, to WWE that you've got to make it more family friendly and cut out some of the edgy stuff. Uh, I wouldn't like to see impact watered down at all. 
So not that there's anything major at the moment that I think, you know, couldn't be shown on WWE television, you know, on PG-13 or whatever it's called. But I, I wouldn't like to see Impact watered down because, there's, you know, things like the, the OVE match versus LAX last year, you, you wouldn't have got anything like that on uh, WWE. So even the Eddie Edwards stuff, actually thinking about it, that most probably wouldn't be on WWE right now. So to answer the question, love to get it on a channel where they're going to give them support, they'll pay them good money and they'll get viewers. But I wouldn't want it to change the product. See, and I'm of the mindset, and if I don't know if you remember, but when they had, uh, when they were on Destination America, there was a, for a period of time, they had Ring of Honor on there as well. So Ring of Honor was leading into Impact, but Ring of Honor, they it, they only would get like an hour block. So it was a lot of things crammed in. And, you know, for me, I hadn't really followed Ring of Honor. So I was like, all right, cool. It's something I get to watch uh, up until Impact comes on. The thing I think, I think it'd be best for them. Like, I like the relationship that they have with Pop because I've always, you know, thought that Pop is proud of them. They promote them. They're not embarrassed to promote them. Whereas, you know, we've seen it with Destination America, even on Spike. You know, Spike wasn't pro promoting them heavy. So I think if you put them on the same channel with WWE, here, here's the thing. And I, I know we're op we try to be optimistic thinking about, hey, they're going to gain more viewers but could you imagine watching impact programming and getting a, a wwe promo you know for raw or smackdown or you know their promos you know really being uh, heavily featured whereas on raw or you know the other shows that they have on the network you might not you might see impact just maybe one uh um promo video so the point is i think at the end of the day you know you got some fans that watch both fans that only watch one so i i think it's best for them to have their own channel where you know that channel is the home of their they're not sharing it with another network i mean another company i'm sorry i was going to say just on the promo stuff that if you're saying that you know that they're not going to be featured on wwe television you know maybe only one promo during the three hours the only thing i'd say is that all Impact fans know about WWE, but not all WWE fans know about Impact, if that makes sense. So I, I can see where you're coming from. At the same time, I, I can't really see it being an issue. And I think, if anything, if it gets the name out there, even if it's just one promo, you know, to say stay tuned after the Raw to go and see last week's Impact or whatever it may be, surely that's got to be a good thing. Because I don't think suddenly you're going to get Impact viewers on the USA Network saying, oh, well, you know what, I've only got time for one. I'm going to watch Raw instead of Impact. Yeah, if you're watching Impact, you watch it because you like it. Um, so I, I know where you're coming from, but I really don't see that as a as an issue. But uh, another good question. Thank you, Colby, for that one. Um, really, really appreciate it. Right. I suppose we better break down this week's uh, Impact. So uh, what did you think of the show before we dive into the segments? Uh, I thought it was good. I mean, there wasn't I really I didn't find anything that I didn't like. I mean, everything was was pretty solid. And I don't think this week you're going to convince me otherwise. No, no, absolutely. I, I think it was actually really good. Uh, I thought it was a good show. Compared to the last two weeks, it was a vast improvement. Uh, I don't know if it was a coincidence that we didn't have any out of, you know, at, at someone else's wrestling convention or something like that, any matches from from around the world. Uh, the fact that we didn't have those, I think, helped as well. It made it feel like more like a complete show that it was all done with a fluid you know, storyline narrative going on. So, I, yeah, I thought it was really good. Um, you know, it wasn't as as good as some of the shows have been. But as I said a few weeks ago, you know, that's a really high bar. But the wrestling, all the all the wrestling matches made sense to have them on the show. It wasn't something that was just thrown together, except for possibly the first one. But you know, we'll come on to that in a sec. But everything else made sense on the show, and, and everything progressed. I don't think there was any storyline in there, off the top of my head that didn't get a bit of progression on on the show which is all all i ever sort of say is i just want to you know feel like everything is progressing in the right direction so I, it, it ticked all those boxes for me so we started off with um you know a, a package of dj z and andrew everett uh you know talking about their journey very similar to what we've seen already but you know once again great story i i really like these opening segments and we talk about it every week but you know, once again, another quality package here. And I thought it was excellent. You know, it's cool. And we forget because I know they've been highlighting, you know, the incident that happened with DJ Z where it looked like he was about to, I think he had a near death experience or something of that magnitude. But we forget that Andrew Everett was on the shelf too. So having this story 
and even though I know the title win it seemed sudden but they're really kind of investing in getting us invested in the characters of, of this team and that's encouraging because you know like we've always said we need more tag teams so this looks like this is a tag team here to stay Actually, now that, now that we talked about the, the tag team win last week, <laughs> the only thing I, I do think they missed this week was they didn't have an Eli Drake or Steiner on there, actually, um, other than in this clip. But um, unless you can correct me on that, I can't remember seeing them yeah, anywhere they, else on the show. They had late, and I'm sure we'll get it to it later on the show. They had an interaction. All right, okay. I, I forgot all about it if, if it did happen, but uh, I'll see it uh, as we go through the the breakdown of the show anyway. Right, okay, so we kicked off. Um, oh, we had Don Callis back on commentary, by the way, and what a difference. I really like Don Callis. And even the segments where, you know, they were in front of the screens, you know, I thought it was quite funny, some of the looks that he gave Josh and the way that he's ribbing him. So, yeah, uh, it, what a great, well, not great addition. Obviously, he's in the background, but it's great to have him actually on commentary because there was, there was talk at one point that he wasn't going to do it because he was obviously doing commentary for, for one of the Japanese firms. So we let's get into the matches. Uh, it started off with OVE, uh, with Sammy Callahan, obviously, um, in attendance as well, versus uh, Drago or Drago and Aerostar. Now, one thing that, that did stick out to me in this match was, is that a fake tongue that he dangles out? Because uh, it's quite gross, you know, his black tongue. <laughs> that, and and I, had to, I tried to pause it two, three times. I even called the kids in, you know, to say, is that real? Is that real? And then my daughter showed me that she can put her tongue below her chin as well, which I thought was weird. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a therapy session for another day. Um, yeah, so is it a real tongue? I don't know. I mean, I'd imagine <laughs> it's not, but it, it's, it's pretty interesting, I, got, I must say. Anyway, uh, into the match. W what did you think of this match? You know, I like where it was headed. And I mean, you know, I've stated in the past my favorite tag team in Impact Wrestling is OVE. And I thought a match like this gave them an opportunity to, you know, show that they're still a credible tag team. Because I think with the feud with Callahan and Eddie Edwards, OVE's really kind of been in the background. So I, I thought with a match like this, and this was a good showing uh, from Drago and Aerostar as well. Things looked somewhat clean. Um, I just didn't like, and, and you know, I understand the big picture as far as, you know, with Eddie coming out and, you know, get, it's the DQ victory for OVE, you know, and there's probably more of a continuance to, with his angle with Sammy Callahan. Um, I really wanted to see how this match would have ended. I really liked where it was going uh, up until the interference. Yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, the, the uh, Aerostar and Drago, they, they could have been anyone. It didn't really matter, did it, that they were facing OV. This was never about the competitiveness of the match or what it meant if you won it. It was all about the finish. And uh, But I thought commentary did a good job of, of kind of building up OV and saying, you know, that these two guys are just full, you know, uh, uh, it's like a cult. They were saying, you know, that they, they're brainwashed by Sammy Callahan. They follow him and do his, his work, you know, and they don't, it was good how they placed it and say, they don't care about the tag team titles anymore. They just care about doing Sammy's bidding, which I thought was quite a good way to keep them interesting and keep them a live threat, but not actually have them in the title scene. So yeah, the ending was, was I quite liked it. Um, Sa uh, Eddie Edwards is finally interesting for me. Uh, and this is a problem I've had with him ever since he was in the Wolves, I never thought he had much charisma. And, and now he's doing something that's really interesting. You know, it, it's kind of one of those things you would have thought, if I would have asked you when the Wolves break up, and we see this with a lot of tag teams, there's always one guy who obtains great single success and the other one that um, essentially becomes a Genetti. I guess that's the thing you always look <laughs> at. Like someone becomes a Shawn Michaels and someone becomes a Genetti. And we see this with it. It, throughout the history of wrestling you know you can look at a uh, bully ray devon or even the miz and morrison like i would have thought that davy richards would have been the one to ch achieve more success than eddie um i think this angle has really kind of broke eddie away from that whole um I forget what's the term. I know BQ would used to use it. There was a, a term that's eluding me right now. But it really kind of gave him some layers to his character. And as much as I've been enjoying this feud, I'm interested to see after this feud culminates, what's next. You know, because I, I really think what's next for the both of these guys, you know, we're talking about the title picture. 
you know, I'd love to see them inter- integrated back into the title picture. I don't want to say I, back because Callahan hasn't been there, but you know what I'm trying to say? Because I, I really think, you know, they got to freshen that up. So, but yeah, the the character work with Eddie Edwards, this whole evolution where he's having an edge now, I, I thought, you know, if he were to turn heel, although we don't need any more heels, it wouldn't surprise me. Whereas if you asked me a year ago, I mean, I thought he was a baby face for life. Mm. Um, just by the way, when we split up on the podcast, you're, you're certainly the Genetti. All right, I'm, I'm the uh, <laughs> I'm the HBK on this one. <laughs> but yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, uh, as I said, you know, Eddie Edwards to me has never had any character. It was always Davy Richards was was the guy who I would like to see. And, and funny enough, when I went to the tapings last year, I think that was Davy Richards' last set of tapings for the company, and, and he was great. You know, and uh, it was this is a shame that he went. I, w- I wouldn't be surprised if at some point they reteam and, and have another run as the wolves but um i know that he's he's gone off to do a medical degree or something like that hasn't he but i think he still does rest on it would surprise me if some way down the line that they get back together um but yeah uh the angle continues and, and obviously by the sounds of it um it sounds like it's going to be a street brawl somewhere that's going to be filmed out of the impact zone in the same kind of way that you had Jeremy Borash and Steiner last year, you know, that kind of all well, final deletion. I think it's going to be something like that that finishes this because they've had a lot of hardcore matches together. You know, they've done all this. So I think there's only one thing that the way that this can finish, and that's with some spectacular match of some sort, because nothing else really fits. There's no other way to get away from this now. You can't just have a regular match or even a street fight in the ring because it feels like we've already had that a few times. So I, I think they have to do something special to finish this now. How, how do you think it's going to end? Man, you know what? I And see, that's why I kind of hate at the Impact versus Lucha when they did the I Quit. And I know that was looked at more as... um you know, a, a bit like a special event, you know, I know a lot of the storylines, uh, they, you know, whatever happened there, it didn't, ex- with exception to that one, obviously didn't really tie into impact storylines, but that would have been the biggest match, the big payoff. And I think them doing that, um, if I had to go out on limb, I, I would say a last man standing, that'd probably be the best way to go. You know, mm-hmm. that way they could beat the hell out of each other and then, you know, watching them trying to get up. But I, I really don't know what what else is left or even if you have an God, I always forget the name of this match. What's that match where it's a cage and the weapons are uh, uh, hanging from the cage? Isn't that lethal lockdown? Is that what it? OK. Or some kind of mayhem, maybe mm. something like that. I, I think that would be, you know, be a nice uh, way to blow off the feud. But I think doing street fights, I mean. Uh, you know, even that that most recent one they had, it it didn't do it. It didn't. I didn't feel like there was enough hate. So I think if they were gonna blow off the few, those would probably be the two matches that I would like. I, I think that if they're gonna do something like another street fight, yeah, they have to have a pre-recorded segment where they pull off some crazy stunts. You know. Uh, out of the studio, just so that um, it, it gives it that extra. Th- this is it. This is. This is the end of it now. It'll be interesting to see where Eddie goes, though. Let us know, listeners. If you've got any ideas of how you'd like to see this feud end, then please do let us know. And uh, obviously, we didn't mention that Alicia was in this segment as well, shouting, it's over, it's over. Unfortunately, her shouting, it's over, never ended. Uh, It just went on forever. But there you go. Um, All right. So then we had uh, Carlos and Matthews in the the studio talking about the, the feud and what else is going on in the show. One thing that they did do, which I quite liked, they compared this to Tommy Dreamer versus Raven, um, which once again was another brutal blood feud, and and uh, I, I like it when they compare it to, to matches of old and feuds of old. So I think it was a good and it was a good actual comparison. To be fair, yeah, you know what it had me thinking. I was like, it it would be weird, but I was like, I could see a scenario where they have you know their final match, and Alicia turns on Eddie and aligns with. Uh, Callahan and joins the OVE, but then I don't know how much mileage you could get out of that. Yeah, but the thing is, if they do that, then the feud's going to continue for another year. But yeah, I, do you know, it did enter my mind as well that at some point, especially when he started talking to her in the hospital and those kind of things, you know, it did seem like maybe he started to brainwash her as well. But uh, we'll see where it goes. We'll see. Um, it'll be interesting if. If they did go down that route and then it seems like, oh, you know, Eddie's finally, you know, now at peace with Sammy and he can walk away and then she turns on him and it kicks it back off again. Now, yeah, actually, I can see that working. Right. 
All right. Uh, my two favorite tag teams in the world next, uh, Cult of Lee versus LAX. And, and that's not me coming out with some major hyperbole. I really do like both of these tag teams, and I think they, they're both incredible for different reasons. So uh, what did you make of this one? I loved it. Um, I think these two teams have great chemistry, and it's kind of a shame that during the time when LAX was champions that their feud with Cult of Lee, you know, it, it seemed what just to run two matches. It was one match and then the title match and that's it. Um, I hope these guys can mix it up more in the future. And obviously, Cult of Lee get the win, which is great for them. So, you know, we see two teams in the tag team division get wins, you know, to still show that, you know, making them look somewhat credible and LAX is still going through their wo woes. I really like what they've done with LAX, giving them something outside of just chasing the tag team titles. And I'm really interested to see what happens next with them. Yeah, just on the LAX thing, it's funny because although they've been on a losing streak since Redemption, I'm guessing it's, it's been, um, they still don't look weak in all these losses, do they? You know, they still look like a credible tag team and they look unlucky as opposed to not good, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's great that, you know, that they and they refer to it on commentary as well. It's not something that they, they just ignore the fact that they've been on a losing streak. You know, they said, you know, they've been on a losing streak. And I think it's a great piece of storytelling. It really is a great piece of storytelling. Um, and I, I think there's some mileage in where, where this goes next. It's it's good stuff. But cultivately, uh, do you know what? I really like their look. And, and I, I, usually, I, I quite often talk about, you know, wrestlers looks and these kind of things, which is part of the reason why I don't like Andrew Everett. Um, but they look like two hillbillies, especially now that Caleb's grown a really wispy beard to look like Trevor Lee. I think they look great, you know, and, and it goes back, you know, helps back to some of the older wrestlers. You don't have to be, you know, ripped to, you know, with a six pack, you know, they're more along the lines of uh, the, the bushwhackers or something like that in that they just look like normal guys who are in the ring. And, and I, I, I think they're brilliant. I really can't get enough of Cult of Lee. I think they've been one of the big success stories over the last year. Yeah, I really think the pairing, because, you know, at first we had thought, because remember they had uh, Andrew Everett a part of it, but I thought that pairing, it gave Trevor Lee something to do, because I think Trevor Lee's the one guy, and I've spoke about this in the past, where they can move him up and elevate him. You know, he's done, I think, all he could can in the X Division, but I thought him tagging with Conley gives Conley something to do outside of just being a lackey, so to speak. So I've really enjoyed the pairing and their work as a tag team. Um, and like you said, with LAX, they've looked strong in defeat. I mean, we even seen in this match, it was a roll up with the tights. And, you know, that's one of those things I know a lot of people hate. Uh, roll up pins to to win matches but i love it from a hill perspective when you got you know the feet on the ropes or um mm. you know rolling up the the tights i, I like that I, I think it worked perfectly for for the cult of lee to to win in this fashion and for lax to lose in this fashion i think you know it plays in with the storyline perfectly doesn't it so uh no no problem with it at all and yeah we'll come back onto lax when, when we look at the segment later on uh, backstage but yeah i thought it was uh, quite a decent match as well and the good thing is as you say cult of lee can go on to something else would you like to see another member in cult of lee and if so any ideas of who that would be you know i think right now they're good the way that they are because i think the the one thing and um we'll we'll get into this towards the end i think the one thing that impact doesn't need to fall fall into is where you have a, a whole gang of stables if if you know what i'm saying because you know we only get a two-hour show and you know sometimes there's certain people we're not able to see and when you have a stable of five and six guys you know it's it, it took long enough for them to finally use conley where he was actually you know wrestling in matches in you know meaningful matches so when you're talking about a stable you know a lot of times you could just be throwing people in and they're lackeys so i think for the time being they're fine the way they are uh there's a question for our listeners uh, who would you like to see join the cult of lee if anyone or do you think they should just stay as a twosome uh, i think they could add someone but i don't wouldn't like to see anyone outside of the x division joining them because i, I think they've got a good thing going on with the tag and if they threw in someone like i don't know um 
uh, well, I'm trying to think of an ex-division wrestler who could go in there, who could fit in. Someone like P.T. Williams I could see fitting in there uh, as an example. Um, I think he would, would suit him down because he's a, an established ex-division guy and he could be their ex-division uh, lackey. So, yeah, uh, I would like to, to see them maybe add one more because two people doesn't really feel like a cult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'll tell you this. You know what? If you know how we're always talking about, and there, it was one of the questions, and I know we had talked about it before, that's why I didn't uh, bring it up. But I know a lot of times people want to know, oh, who would you like to see join Impact? Mm -hmm. That would be the perfect way to debut somebody, have them say join the cult of Lee, you know, have them run with him and then break away. That's why I always just say, you know, some of these people who join the company wouldn't always have to just thrust them in the main event. Have them be part of a stable for a couple months, then break away and then go like that. Could you imagine here? I'll, I'll, I'll say this and we can move on. What if you turned, and this is probably going to sound so crazy, you turn Brian Cage Hill and he somehow joins the cult of Lee. What about that? Well, yes. Um, he just he, at least you'd have a mouthpiece for him. So yeah, that wouldn't be an, uh, actually wouldn't be a bad show. Do you know? Bizarrely, the one that sprung to my mind was Chandler Park. I don't know why, because uh, obviously he since he was destroyed by Congo Kong, he hasn't been seen, and I don't know if we're going to see um, Joseph Park much longer on screen as well. So he seemed a bit dim witted, Chandler Park. So maybe he's the kind of person who could be brainwashed by, by uh, Trevor Lee of some sort. So anyway, that was that was my outside bet as well. Okay, so then talking of Congo Kong, we had a, a backstage segment with Jimmy and Congo and Mackenzie Mitchell. <sighs> Wasn't really much to say about this. Uh, it was fine for what it was. Uh, any comments? No, not really. Just uh, talking up Kong. Um, you know, like I said, it just seems like after we've seen him put Johnny Impact on the shelf and then he faced Grado, you know, they... This is probably his next big uh, feud or feud that he's had. So, yeah, n really nothing really to elaborate on. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, if we're going to talk about backstage segments and we've only got a certain amount of time, you know I want to talk about KM and Falabar more than, than, <laughs> than Congo Congo Moose. So, so let's move on to that segment. That was next. Uh, KM talking to Falabar uh, about doing things the KM way. Uh, I don't know how he dresses the KM way when he's wearing exactly the same clothes, but there you go. Um, so they notice Grado hanging out with uh, Katarina backstage. Um, I didn't love this segment. And the thing that that drew me out of it was Katerina is such a bad actress. Uh, she really is. And she's been terrible at every segment since she's come back. I mean, she looks amazing, but she, she kind of takes me out of each segment. I thought Grado was good at this, by the way. Um, maybe it's because he talks like he would do if he lived in Glasgow, which is where I live. Um, maybe it doesn't come across well for the international scene, but uh, I thought the, his, uh, his banter at this point was quite good this week. I think the thing I didn't like, I mean, I've been enjoying the segment, but I feel like it took two steps back because, you know, you started seeing the past couple of weeks. I know KM is talking about trying to get Fala in shape, but, you know, he kind of resorted back to kind of the bully character, so to speak, with, you know, how he was uh, approaching Grado. And that's what I didn't understand because I thought the whole the point of it was to build them up. And I mean, I don't know, they're going to be a tag team or whatever. So. Um, I mean, not that it bothered me or anything like that, but I just felt like it kind of, you know, you, what was the point of him, you know, trashing Grado? You know, it, it just didn't make much sense to me. Well, I, I, I personally think what's happening here is that when they had Tyrus uh, finish up with this bullying segment, I think that had more legs. And I think it was going to continue to some extent. But because he left, I think they've rebooted the storyline to keep it as a, a fat shaming angle of some sort. Uh, but they're playing it a little bit longer now. And that I think KM is, is, is going in there and he's leading KM, uh, sorry, Fala down the garden path, so to speak. And, and it's going to end up back with KM bullying and that he hasn't changed at all. And he's just doing this to, to waste his time and for whatever reason, you know, to set him up of some sort. And I think that's where this is going, that there's that, that KM and Falabar aren't going to be around for long as a tag team and they're going to be uh, feuding again at possibly Slammiversary as another match. So I don't think this is a long-term storyline, which is a shame because I think there was mileage in putting them as a tag team. I, I just think that this segment shows that what they're doing with KM is that, you know, his true colours are coming back out again and, and this is all some plan of his for some reason. But yeah, a bit of a chubby chaser, apparently, Katerina is. I'm in there! I'm in there! <laughs> Yay, I'm going to send her my picture later. Right, um, did you guys have the uh, GWN moment of the week this week? 
Yeah. Um. You didn't. You guys didn't get it out in the UK. Well, I watched it on the app, so I did see it. So I'm not sure if it was on the the TV recording or not. But uh, yeah, it was Bully Ray, Jeff Hardy, and Brooke Hogan. And it was interesting this week um, that they they didn't really uh, have a match. <laughs> which usually they show a match, don't they? But this was more of a moment this week. So uh, I, I say I don't mind them doing this because obviously there's a lot of star power that was on screen. And Brooke Hogan. You know what they did after, um, I'm, I'm trying to look to see, because I, I want to say it was uh, what they did is they had the the Bully Ray, Jeff Hardy confrontation, and then they had a match after. Um, I, I think it was Aces and Eights ran out, didn't they? And it was like a brawl more than anything. Yeah, and then they had a match after because I remember they had it was um, for Lethal Lockdown that you know where someone gets the man advantage, and it was Mr. Anderson versus James Storm. But <clears throat> if I may, uh, let me just elaborate on the uh, Bully Ray Jeff Hardy angle. You know the one thing, and I know you know a lot of Impact fans have um, called him out and been critical of Bully Ray because I know Bully Ray every. Uh, well, f- so I've heard every opportunity he gets, he'll trash, you know, then TNA trash the company. And it's really unfortunate because they took a guy who was, you know, essentially just a tag team guy and they made him a credible world champion. I mean, that Bully Ray character, I mean, he did that was some of the best work that I have seen, you know, him do following him, following him as a wrestling fan. And, um, you know, as far as far as with this flashback, I thought it was cool, but I think the only thing that bothered me during this time, once again, you think about the two your your two the two guys that you have headlining are two guys from the former uh, another company. I felt like during this era, we saw a lot of the homegrown TNA guys, you know, taking a back seat to you know the former W you know the former WWE guys. So you know you weren't having just say for example. Uh, AJ Styles versus Jeff Hardy for the World Championship headliner and pay-per-view. It was two former WWE guys. And that was the thing that used to always just bother me. It was never so much that you're bringing the guys on board, but you're pu- pushing them into the main event and then your own guys are having to take a back seat. Uh, it actually brings up an interesting point. And we, we've recorded a whole show on Aces and Eights, which uh, at some point might see the light of day uh, uh, on the channel. So do ch- check that out when it happens. But you do bring an interesting point about Bully Ray. He is obviously one of the most decorated, if not the most decorated tag team wrestler of all time. But when you think of him now, do you think of him as a WWE guy? Because he was there for a huge amount of his success as a tag team. Or do you think of him as an impact guy because of the Bully Ray character? Um, Same with Kurt Angle, you know, is he a WWE guy or is he an impact guy? I mean, EC3 is more clear cut because although he was WWE, you know, he built, he developed his character in impact. Um, But, to some extent, I feel that's the same with Bully Ray. He was a tag team wrestler, but Impact made him into a single star. So so how do you consider him? Do you think he is a, a WWE guy still? I know he trashes everyone except for WWE, but... I think it just, it's kind of one of the examples where, you know, like you said, it's the gimmicks, the two different gimmicks. I think when you're talking about the Bubble Ray... Even I, yeah, Bubble Ray, because he was, I think he was Brother Ray when I was part mm. of Team 3D. That's associated with, you know, WWE or ECW. Whereas Bully Ray, that's synonymous with TNA. The Bully Ray character was TNA. That was his single run. He didn't use that as a tag team. That was his single run where, you know, he had captured the TNA world title on uh, two occasions. So if you were saying the Bully Ray character, that's TNA. So, yeah, it, it, it's 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 kind of split. And, you know, I can't think at the top of my head where we've had an instance like that. Because I think even when you talk about Kurt Angle, I know I think Kurt Angle was in TNA if for long, as long, if not longer than his Longer. TNA. Yeah, longer. Yeah. You know, but I, I, I think, though, with the success that he had gained at an early time in his WWE career, it would always be WWE. But I, I'll tell you one guy that you could probably... You could probably say call him a TNA guy, even though I'm sure he's probably considered a WWE guy to most. But Christian Cage, or no, okay, there you go, right there. Christian Cage and Christian. Christian Cage is synonymous with TNA because we've seen the success he had under the Christian Cage character. Whereas Christian, you know, we know him, you know, as even though he had uh, attained some success over there as tag team guy with Edge. 
Yeah, I knew where you were going to go with that one. Uh, I knew you were going to go Christian Cage on me there. Anyway, uh, I think, by the way, you were saying some fans don't like Bully Ray. I think it was me on, on that Special Aces and Eights podcast. I think I called him a piece of crap. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I liked his Bully Ray character. I think, as you say, best work he's ever done. But yeah, I, I think as a human being, he's, he's not up to much. Right, okay. Um, then we had a segment with... Kira, uh, Kiera, Kiera, Hogan um, and Tessa Blanchard, they showed the match last week. And well, it was a Madison Rain segment, let's face it. Oh, man. Madison Rain, she's she's a good looking woman. And I think she's been a great character. But oh, she annoys me. She, she's so whiny. Honestly, her voice just goes through me. It's like nails down a board. Uh, so this segment, you know, I think Blanchard's bit was great. But um, yeah. We know what we're getting next week, don't we? We're getting Blanchard versus Rain, and and as we've said before, we've got this horrible feeling that this isn't going to go the way that we hope it goes. You know, the thing in with under pressure being next week, I just kind of feel like I wish we had one more week to kind of build, you know, this actual matchup. You know, it just kind of just seems thrown together. We see Madison Rain come in and save Kira Hogan from Tessa Blanchard. Okay, and then this week, you know, we we get the the confrontation between amongst some two backstage, and then okay, next week they're facing each other under pressure. Like it just it, it, it's kind of one of these things. And the of the one criticism that I have, and uh, to be fair, I understand. You know, this is kind of you know the last couple of episodes of this block set of tapings. Some things have seemed rushed. They haven't been given enough time to kind of build. And I felt like something like this was kind of just pushed like, okay, all right, you guys are having a match at Under Pressure because Under Pressure is deemed as a big special event. So, yeah. So you're quite right. Up next was um, DJ Z and Everett, and uh, it, it featured Scott Steiner and Eli Drake. Once again, this wasn't really about the champs at this point. It was more to do with Steiner and Drake you know, sowing those seeds of uh, contention and, and going their separate ways by the looks of it very shortly. So, yeah, it, I forgot all about this segment. Um, but it does seem like, you know, Stein is not staying around and it's a short-term deal by the looks of it. You know, it's just weird. I didn't, the thing that I didn't um, particularly care for, Steiner was more mad than, and I mean, I know Eli Drake, you know, was upset too, but I, I, I really thought, really thought that this should have been a segment where Eli was just kind of just berating uh, Scott Steiner and Scott Steiner kind of like soaking his head because you know Scott Steiner had cost a match but then he was justifying like oh well you were in the way so when I was trying to toss you the chair you ran into it so they were bickering back and forth and then Steiner had threatened him I really would have liked you know Eli just to go all in on him like you know what you're old I died. you know just berating him mm. I thought it I thought it would have made Eli look stronger instead of bickering back and forth. That was just my take. And as we said, it does look like Eli's going. I really hope he doesn't. But it, just the way he's been booked at the moment, and uh, it feels EC3 esque, doesn't it? Um, just just the character development, the storylines that he's involved in. It feels like they're preparing for the worst. So uh, let's hope it doesn't happen. But anyway, okay. Um, my favorite match of the night next, uh, Matt Seidel versus Phantasma. And as I said, they, they have gone with Phantasma as a face now. Uh, he does seem to be a face. The only thing about this match that bothered me was there didn't seem to be much in the way of uh, crowd excitement, which I was quite surprised by. I, I like the match. I think, you know what, and I'll, I have to kind of remove some of the fandom. I was bummed out that Phantasma, they didn't, Put, decide to give Phantasma the win. I feel like, you know, he's one of these guys, you know, they've kind of gone stop and go because I want to say this is a second, I don't know, second or third uh, opportunity for the X Division Championship. And it seemed like they were building him up quite a bit. So I, I wonder what's, you know, the case with him. You know, and I, I get, I know Seidel's doing a fantastic job being X Division Champion, but. You know, I'm all about taking a chance sometimes. And I'm not saying so much play hot potato with some of these belts or give people token reigns. But I think sometimes, you know, when you have somebody keep challenging, 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 and they come up short, you know, essentially they're perceived as a loser. Like, if they're not going to win it now, they're never going to win it. So I, I kind of wish that uh, Phantasma would have got the win here. But, you know, Seidel gets to retain. I, I think he hit the nail on the head there. I think seidel has been awesome. Uh, he's been really, really good, and he's thoroughly deserved his title run. 
maybe because it wasn't a special that they didn't put it on him, you know, to have the title change hands on just an impact episode. Maybe there was some logic behind that. I also think that Phantasma hasn't looked great in the ring uh, in the last, in this, certainly in this block of tapings. And I don't know if he's disinterested or, or what, but we know this guy can go in the ring, but he just hasn't looked that great. I don't think. And maybe, so that has something to do with it as well. I, I really don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see Phantasma after the next set of tapings because it, I don't know if he wants to be there. I really don't know. He, he doesn't give me that air of someone who really wants to be there. But, you know, we go, the kid can go. And uh, I hope he does get another chance. And, and he repays that by actually, you know, showing that he wants to be there. But anyway, uh, Sadell retains by a pinfall, no interference. I like him. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever liked Matt Seidel, and he's doing sterling work at the moment. And and hopefully he'll he'll continue the reign. And when he does finally lose it, it will be a big deal. I see. I don't think this would have been a big deal if they lost it. That's the problem. They did they haven't built it up enough because it was pretty much he's won the number one contendership, and next week he's got the match, and it's gone again now. So I don't know who challenges next. Um, I'm guessing they could be going down a Brian Cage route. Uh, although there was a match, wasn't there? For the, oh, that's the next match up. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, it does look like that Brian Cage is hanging around the X Division for the time being. So maybe that's the route that they're going down, that they're going to get Brian Cage to take it off him. Right. Um, so you said you like this next segment with Eddie Kingston. Do you want to talk us through it? Yeah. You know, we obviously get LAX throwing a fit, you know, because they've been on a losing streak. And then we get the returning king, Eddie Kingston. And uh, he just assures them that everything's cool, but that Conan had to be getting jumped. And he was just talking about, you know, how they've been on a downward spiral since they lost their tag team championships. And they need to step back up and get things going. And the thing that I liked about this, I felt this was the most impactful Eddie Kingston has been in impact you know, his whole tenure, even when you stem back from the DCC, I felt like, and not to his fault, obviously, but he was, and I'm not going to say he was miscasted, but what so much that what was going on where, you know, the tag team scene during that time was being hostage by the Hardys and the whole broken garbage. Um, you know, he really didn't get an opportunity. And I think this role for him for the time being is perfect. I, I just liked how he delivered, um, you know, kind of being, I don't even want to say like a hitman, but kind of like, you know, the guy, you know, so I, I really love this. Yeah, I thought, I thought it was a good segment. The only thing that has always bothered me is that they keep talking about uh, the shipments are safe. <laughs> no, no, I, I, it just bothers me that they keep talking about this. I'm, I'm guessing they're alluding to drug shipments of some sort. I don't know. But I, I really would like to see a breakdown of their business plan and, you know, where they t plan to take these shipments in the future. I sound like one of the dragons from Dragon's Den here. Uh, no, I'm only joking, of course. But yeah, you, you're right. Eddie Kingston was great in this. And he seems like an interesting character again. And uh, as I said, I, I think Santana and Ortiz are great, you know, so um, I'm, I'm glad that they're doing something away from the titles at the moment. And it's interesting. And yeah, well, let's see where it goes. Um, it was interesting that they, they, they referenced homicide in there um, it, as being the second in command after Conan. Now, the only reason I, I thought it was interesting is that he hasn't he's barely been on screen in the last year. So. And when he has been on screen, I don't think he's wrestled other than maybe like a 20-second match against Alberto uh, in a gauntlet. Uh, other than that, I can't think when, when uh, Homicide has, uh, has appeared at all. So it's strange that they've referenced him as second in command. I would have thought this would have been an easy way to write them off and, and basically say, oh, yeah, you know, uh, Conan got attacked, but I've got him safe. I'm second in command and just introduce Eddie that way. So, so maybe they are going to bring back Homicide. But I just thought it was bizarre that he was referenced. Okay, one thing I forgot to mention in the last match, by the way, um, the, the Phantasma match, was the commentary team talked about uh, the jackass in the audience wearing the lucha mask and the jackets and all those kind of things. I don't know if you picked up on that way he was talking about it. But the thing that made it funny was that the jackass they referred to in the lucha mask held up a sign later on in the show with uh, BQ's name on it. Uh, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you noticed, did you? Yeah, you know, um, Callis had been ripping the crowd the whole night, which I thought, 
you know, it was, you know, because he, essentially he's playing like a hill like commentator, but he had been ripping the audience the whole night. It was kind of funny. But yeah, I seen the sign like, you know, I, you know, how you happen to be laying down watching something I'm like, oh, snap, BQ's <laughs> BQ's uh, uh, name. This is the second time that a sign mm. with BQ's name has been on there. I told him, I said, man, you're getting all this airtime. The company's going to end up signing you. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, you know, uh, if we do have listeners who go to the show and uh, they're holding up signs, you know, for BQ, uh, I think we should start the movement now. Hashtag Adam is greater than Roe. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I want to see that on the show. OK, so if you're the dude who's holding that sign, or if anyone can get on the front row and hold up that sign at the uh, the Canada tapings, Adam greater than Roe. You heard it here first. Let's start this. <laughs> I, I'm going to pick it up every week now. Right. OK, uh, we had Austin Aries talking about not getting the job against Pentagon Jr. I'm conscious of time. So um, he talks about he feels to be he's the one true champion. They're building up well. But as I said, I'm worried the fact that Pentagon Jr. really isn't being featured here. You know, it, it's all about the challenger. And, you know, if you're going to put the belt on someone, even if they have a trouble with you know the English language, at least do something interesting to keep them in the limelight. Because all we're doing at the moment is having his challenges as the guys who are who are pushing those feuds. And I'm not really interested in the feud. It, it just doesn't interest me at all, really. It just, it seems like the safe move. Like I said, I think putting the belt on <clears throat> excuse me on Pentagon Junior just came across as more as a shock value. And I think them not getting or garnishing what they thought because i know and to be fair you know we got uh nba playoffs going on so i know the ratings this week had dipped to two hundred and sixty three thousand. but i think what they thought putting the belt on pentagon and what they've been getting as far as like the fan interest is not at the level that they anticipated because you know i i and i'm surprised that it's taken this long for us to get a rematch i thought that we've already already had the rematch and then we have pentagon facing somebody else so it just makes me wonder will they just des decide like hey this experiment is a failure and just put the belt back on austin aries but before we get into the the next match i just want to add just real quick uh, Callis and Matthews had noted that luckily there had been no mystery attacks. So the moment that they said that, I knew we were going to get a mystery attack. <laughs> it was like a jinx. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, just picking up on the, the failed experiment bit, it's quite hard to do a failed experiment or to change a failed experiment when you take five weeks or six weeks at a time. Um, so you're quite right that they have to call that fairly early at the tapings if they think it's not working. So it'll be interesting to see if they change it now or whether they do change it at the next set of tapings because they've got to do something. Because it, for me, Pentagon Jr., no matter how good he's in the ring, if he's not getting any airtime and he's not coming over from a character point of view, they've got to get it off him. Now, under pressure, is, has this been taped? I'm guessing it has been taped. And the reason I ask that is because um, the next match, uh, Desmond Xavier versus P.T. Williams was to face Brian Cage. And I didn't think Brian Cage was at the last set of tapings. So do you know what the deal is with this? Is it a live show, the next one, or is this a pre-recorded one and, and Brian Cage was actually there? Um, I think it's pre-recorded. I think this is a future match. I, you know, before we got, get into this, I don't understand. And I guess the way that they were selling it is you're getting to challenge his uh, undefeated streak. I thought it was silly. I mean, wouldn't it have made more sense to have these guys challenge, you know, the winner gets a future X Division championship? Like, you know, what does facing Brian Cage do for you, let alone, you know, these are smaller guys. Not saying that they can't have a competitive match with Brian Cage. I just thought it was silly. Like, all right, you two guys are going to get the, the right to face Brian Cage. And let's be honest, between Petey Williams and Xavier, do they, either one of these guys really have a shot? Even if you did a two-on-one, I'm sure Brian Cage can handle these guys with ease. You know, like I said, not that they're not talented enough, but look at Brian Cage and look at these guys. But um, as far as the match, I thought this was this was cool, and I'm glad that they're starting to use Desmond Xavier. I really hope they uh, really get behind him. I really like what he what he does in the X division. Great worker. Um, just his finisher, I just cannot stand that. I don't know why he stopped using the spiral tap. That I don't like anything like handspring and a kick or anything like that. I uh, I, I hate that. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, uh, it, you're quite right. It does seem a strange stipulation, doesn't it? You know, the winner of this match uh, gets to get the shit kicked out of them by uh, Brian Cage next week. So, uh, although I do think it, it it would have been a better match to have Petey Williams versus Brian Cage, because I think it would have been more believable. I really hope next week Brian Cage just tosses Desmond around the ring for, for, for five minutes and then pins him, because it just does not seem like a believable matchup at all. Whereas you could most probably see Petey Williams giving the Canadian destroyer to Brian Cage, but Cage kicking out of it. That would have been a, a good moment. That would have been really an awesome moment. But anyway, um, with regards to Matt... Lee, I'm sorry. You do know Petey Williams is smaller than Desmond Xavier, right? Um, is he? <laughs> yeah, that's what... I was just listening at first. I was like, oh, I thought he's in like psych or anything like that. Uh, I mean, I would... If you ask me either two, I think Desmond Xavier would probably have more of a fair shot. You know, but, you know, essentially both of these guys are, you know, smaller stature. And, you know, we've seen with Brian Cage. Brian Cage is a hell of a worker. And he's, you know, will give a guy enough offense to make, you know, the match seem believable. But it was just, I just didn't get the concept of, you know, facing Brian Cage, facing him for what, you know. So it was just kind so of odd. I, I didn't realize that PT was smaller than Desmond. Uh, you know, it doesn't, I don't know, it just doesn't come over that way. But anyway, uh, if you say so, I will believe you. Uh, <laughs> with regards to this match, yeah, I, I don't like that kind of uh, spinning super kick thing that he does. Uh, does it have a name even? I, I'm not sure. I don't know. It's just uh, he does that little, it's like a handspring and then that back kick. Mm. I, yeah, I, I mean, I just I just don't get it. I, I think, you know, a finisher can do do wonders for a lot of people and you got to have the right move and even if you remember with eli drake early in his uh impact career he was using that where he would knee you to the head or do like a knee lift and clothesline and i always said if you're gonna push him to the main event he needs a better finisher than that you're not winning no world titles using that move so i just yeah. with, with desmond xavier you know hopefully he goes back to that spiral tap but uh with that said the match um this was great you know they both guys had good chemistry a lot of crisp moves. I'm I'm not one of these guys. Like I understand accidents happen, but you know you hate with sometimes with the X division where it gets a little bit too botchy. But uh, we didn't yeah. see any of that in this match. It's funny because when you watch Shimori's matches, you don't feel like there's going to be any botches in there. Uh, and it certainly isn't. But yeah, with some of these guys, maybe not P.T. Williams much, but Xavier, I don't know. I I don't buy into him. I know that there's a lot of love for him out there. And I know you like him and BQ likes him. Uh, he does nothing for me. He really doesn't. So but anyway, let's hope uh, Brian Cage uh, smashes him to bits next week. Right. Uh, OK, so then we had a uh, an Ali segment backstage, you know, clips of last week's uh, of the, the Sue Young funeral. Or I should say the Rosemary funeral. And uh, yeah, this was really interesting. I didn't overly like the editing again of this which is strange because i always say that the segments are really good at the beginning of the shows and the packages but it, it does as i said it feels like a high grade horror project you know horror movie project at times the editing um you know close-ups of door handles opening and those kind of things and i didn't like it but having said that i really liked what they did with this the music and and the fact that we're now seeing Ali go dark, I, I thought it was great. I'm guessing the B, as in B, don't let the darkness consume you, R, is in reference to Bunny, is it? As in Demon Bunny? And, uh, yeah. Uh, it, I, I'm guessing there would be quite a few people who would be looking at that and thinking, what does the B stand for? But uh, I'm guessing it's Bunny. But yeah, really, the, the look looks, you know, the dark, make, the rosary makeup on Ali looks incredible. She, she looks fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. You know, I don't mind the change. I do think if we could have had just one more week where we could have seen her kind of like crack and then become, you know, this character, I think it would have been a little bit more impactful because I think essentially, you know, all we saw was, you know, we see the funeral and then the next week, you know, Ali puts on the face, the face paint. You know, not that I have a problem with it. I'm looking forward to the match between her and Sue Young. I believe, believe it's going to be a last rights match at a... a under pressure but i think just one more week where you kind of have ali kind of crack a little bit because you know we're all accustomed to ali being all cheerful you know there's only been mm. a, a few times that we've seen her really be aggressive but uh yeah i, th I thought it was pretty interesting funnily enough <laughs> when you think about it logically that means ali's gonna have to wear that makeup around for a week before the match <laughs> uh, <laughs> doesn't really make much sense in the grand scheme of things you're quite right it would have been better if she'd have done that at the beginning of the show before the, the final match and I kept it as a surprise or even done teasers of it you know on social media over the week 
anyway, uh, she looks amazing. And yeah, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to this. So then we're on to the main event, Congo Kong versus Moose. And bearing in mind, these guys faced off the other week in a pretty awful match outside of the impact zone. This was great. This was really good. And I'm not Moose's biggest fan by a long stretch of the imagination. Yeah, I just said that, but it sounds like I'm coming over like a hater here, you know, because I, I said I didn't like Desmond Xavier. I don't like any of the faces, <laughs> but I really don't rate Moose that much. You know, maybe it's to do with the interview I did with him where he seemed bored, but he he's boring. And that's my biggest problem with him. He doesn't seem to have any personality. I would much rather see Congo Kong do something than, than Moose uh, going forward. Yeah, I think, you know, starting the match and what kind of, through a uh, curve curveball was not having Jimmy Jacobs accompanying accompanying uh, Congo Kong. I enjoyed this. I really think Congo Kong really showed that he can hang in the main event. And you know, Moose is Moose. I think with Moose, he's um, somewhat a limited performer. I don't think he's at that that stage yet where you know you can put him in the ring with anyone and you know have an excellent match i think he has to work with the right individuals that can really bring out you know that next element and take it to a next level but i really was impressed with congo kong i i hope that you know management looks you know down the road and you know keeps him in in that main event picture i thought he can i thought he showed some stuff where he can hang and yeah. obviously obviously moves gets to win um I'm happy he's using the spear. I hate the game changer. Um, I I don't like people who use a normal move as their finisher because he'll use a clothesline and then turn around and the game changer is essentially a clothesline. But I was really, really impressed with Congo Kong in this match. Yeah, absolutely. Um, couldn't agree more. The only thing I didn't like was the ending. It seemed a bit too easy. You know, a spear cover. I would like to maybe a bit more suspense or a bit more fight from Congo Kong. And I know they were playing it that because Jimmy wasn't there, you know, he wasn't at his A game. But I, I think that he could have put up a bit more of a fight because, you know, I don't think there was that many pins on Congo Kong during the match. So it just seemed like, you know, the first attempt and there's the victory. But no, overall, uh, yeah, it shows that he can hang and they've obviously got big things for, for Moose going forward. Although I don't know where that leaves Congo Kong now. Uh, it seems like a strange storyline, but maybe he'll get involved in the post-match thing in that uh, Jimmy Jacobs was attacked by the mystery guy, the mystery attacker. And I like the way that they, they segued out of the match and, you know, the scheme kind of got taken over by some someone in the production facility to show that Jimmy Jacobs was laid out. I thought it was a good way to end the show. Good mystery. Yeah, and then they even had some music this go around. Um, I've changed my stance on this. I had first thought this was a solo act, but I'm starting to believe maybe this is a group that they're going to debut. And we're, while I'm intrigued, I worry too, because as we were talking uh, previously, when we were talking about the Cult of Lee adding uh, more members, I really don't think at this moment, especially since we still don't know the future of the Desi hit squad. I know one of the guys should be debuting on the next set of tapings, but I think another stable, I mean, you know, it's, it, it, you know, unless it consists of guys that are in the roster that, you know, team up, then I guess that's fine. But, you know, trying to bring in a whole nother group, you know, it's, it can be a little bit uh, too much if I may say. So, so basically you're saying you're, you're hoping it's Tito Ortiz. I know you are. You really want Tito Ortiz. Like I said last week, it's bound to be him. I w actually, I would, act, I would accept Tito Ortiz as long as he comes back with Dan Lambert, because that would be amazing. I want Dan Lambert back. Hopefully it's him. Uh, I don't know where that came from, but there you go. Right. Um, we'll have a rundown of uh, next week's show in a second from you, Rogue, because I know you'd like to do that. Hopefully you've got that ready. But while you're looking that up and you're getting it, pulling it together, just a reminder of the trivia question for this week. Uh, who am I? And I debuted for TNA in 2012. I was allegedly an active re wrestler on the roster for three years before I departed in 2015. So I was on the TNA website as an active wrestler for three years, despite having no match in that time. And I came back to Impact last year in an angle, not a wrestling angle, but in an angle where I knocked out uh, one of the Impact wrestlers. So who am I? Um, so next week's show, Ro, what have we got? Yes, for next week's Under Pressure show, the card we're getting is we got Madison Rain versus Tessa Blanchard. And apparently that match against Brian Cage is going to be an X Division number one contenders match. So we're getting Cage versus Desmond Xavier. We're also getting a knockouts title match and a last rights match, which is 
essentially a casket match with Naga's champion Ali defending against Su Young. And then for our main event, the world title match, Impact World Champion Pentagon defending against Austin Aries. It's certainly a stack show, isn't it? And uh, any one of those matches, I think, could uh, could be match of the night. You know, we're, it looks like a fantastic lineup on paper. Uh, and that's without Tito Ortiz even appearing. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, so that's this week's show. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we, we sign off for the week? Um, just that, you know, closing out these taping, this, this, these tapings and stuff, it's been very solid. I'm really looking forward to the next set and seeing the build towards Slammiversary. I think we're in for some surprises. And, um, as far as under pressure, if I had to just go out on limb, I think that last rights match, the knockouts title match is going to be the show stealer. Yeah. I, I, I've got a feeling it will be pretty awesome as well but uh yeah th this this block of tapings i don't think is, was as good as the previous ones but now callis and demore have really got a groove going you know they've had long enough now to to formulate their plan so i think that you know from here on in we should have smooth sailing for impact you know that we're not getting changes in the in the back room so uh, hopefully they now got you know, the long-term direction of where they want to go. And, and the shows do have a feel now that is consistent each week, which is good. And, and I'm really liking it. So, yeah, I, I think this might be the last one next week before the, the Canada taping. So whatever it is that comes out next week, I'm sure it's going to be exciting. We'll leave us with a lot more questions, which is what you want from a wrestling show. Keep you wanting more. But that's us for this week. If you've got any comments, please leave them below. We'll try our best to answer any of your questions, such as the ones from Ramon and Colby earlier on. And please do make sure you hit the subscribe button. But for the time being, that's all for me. This is Adam signing out.